This is Jerry Fry, audio historian of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. The following is the professional history of a PPB member told by herself in her own fashion on this February 9th of 2009. These interviews are being recorded in order to compile firsthand a living history of the members of our organization and the stories of their professional experiences. Many of our members began in what is called the golden age of radio and television. And this is an attempt to preserve as much data as possible for succeeding generations. This recording is not intended for broadcast without first obtaining permission from Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. And with me today in proximity to Hollywood is uh, someone who has been called legendary in her own right, the great June Foray. June, it's very nice to have you with us. You're a board member of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. Thank you, Jerry. I'm glad I'm a living legend. You are a living legend. <laughs> yes, it's better than the other kind That's of right. legend. That's right. Were you a, a charter member of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters? I think I was, yeah. yeah. That goes back was to a what, long time 40, ago. 43 years, I think. Something like that, Something yeah. like that. But uh, let's start at the very beginning of your life and okay. tell me a little bit about where you were born. And was Well, I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, hmm. and uh, my mother was a, a, a singer and a pianist, and my dad was an engineer. And uh, when I was six, they were very esoteric people. And they took us to the theater and to uh, the opera and plays and movies. And at six years old, I was intrigued by actors, and I would come home and impersonate them all at oh, six. Really? Wow. And I told my mother and dad when I was six years old that I wanted to be an actress. And they kind of laughed a little. Sure, <laughs> naturally. Oh, she'll grow out of that phase. <laughs> <laughs> so my, they, they were very supportive people. So my mother said, well, you know, Eleanor Powell came from Springfield, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and she became a very famous dancer in yes. Hollywood. Uh -huh. So she gave me dancing lessons. Good. Fortunately, I caught pneumonia. Oh. And so I couldn't take dancing <laughs> lessons anymore. <laughs> but she was a wonderful pianist, so she mm -hmm. said, well, you've got to take piano lessons. Mm -hmm. My brother was great. He could sit at the piano and play, but I hated it. But she gave me dancing lessons anyway. Okay. And fortunately, I broke my finger playing baseball with my brother, so I couldn't play piano anymore. Boy, so, you got out of you got out of things the hard way, June. <laughs> it was the easy way, fortunately. For you, yeah. <laughs> so um, they said, "Okay, we'll get you." They called them an elocution teacher in those days, mm -hmm. and uh, we were omnivorous readers, all of them all of us, and so we'd go to the library all the time, and I would memorize, you know, the little old lady that I do in the Warner Brothers cartoons, uh -huh. Granny. I invented that, reading The Old Woman Shows Her Medals by James M. Barry. Oh, for him's sake. I would, I, would, I would memorize parts of plays and do the voices. Wow. And so my... A locution teacher put me on the radio mm. when I was 12 years old. Wow. And I had hubris enough to go to the station manager because they had a group of actors every week who would do a different play. And I said, you know, I can do things like that. Mm -hmm. And I was 15. And they said, okay. And mm. that's what started my career. And then my mother and dad brought us kids out to California and I was 17. To, to I, pursue your career? Or what, what was the reason for bringing you to California? Well, my dad had lost all of his money. He was a oh. very wealthy man. Mm -hmm. And during the Depression, he lost all oh, of his money. Dear. So he brought us kids out here. To start a new life. To start a new life, yes, mm -hmm. which we did. And what did, what did your, your dad do for a living at that point? He was an engineer, and I think he, he owned a... a an air conditioning company. I'm not quite sure. Mm. But um, I was writing at that time, and I wrote children's stories. And I, I just peddled them around, mm -hmm. and I was on the <clears throat> air on radio three times a week. I called myself Lady Make Believe. 
I wrote all the stories. That was on the radio station out here? In, radio station in, in, out here. Which, which station? It was, um, it was an ABC station or some station that uh, became okay, ABC. NBC. Mm. I can't remember what station it was. Okay, one of the early broadcasting yeah, stations. Right. And uh, so I was on three <clears throat> times a week as Lady Make Believe. And then... And you would tell stories, read stories to children? Yes, I uh -huh. wrote them and wrote read them, them and, read and them. took all the parts. Good. And uh, it was not sponsored. So I went to the station manager and I said, Newton's always gives a, a commercial after mm -hmm. that. Why don't I go to Newton's and see if they'll sponsor me? I went to Newton's and they thought it was a great idea. I came back and I said to the station manager, well, we're going to be uh, sponsored. And he said, no, you're not. I said, well, I saw the people at Newton's and they thought it was a good idea. And they said, well, Newton's daughter is going to do the same thing. Oh, no. So she took my place. For, <laughs> she became Lady Make Believe? Oh, she didn't call herself she Lady Make Believe, else. but she told children's stories. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it was a disaster for me. Yeah, surely. <laughs> and then, uh, just before the war ended, in 1945, I was still a young girl. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote, I wrote uh, plays for the Office of Civilian Defense mm. for a man called Joe Michike. He was the head of the Office of Civilian Defense out here. And... I hired, well, didn't hire them because we didn't pay any money, yeah. but a lot of the radio actors, and of course I would do all the female parts that I wrote. Sure. And one of them, Herb Vibrant was his name, very well known in radio. Yes, up here. I remember that name. Yes, and Herb said, June, you're talented. You should be doing national public radio. He told me where to go, how to, how to, and, just advance myself by by talking to uh, uh, the advertising agencies mm -hmm. and sitting at CBS, mm -hmm. and if a producer came in, to go running after him, grab him by the arm, and say, I can do this. Yeah, the and, ad agencies controlled a lot of radio broadcasts in those days. Yes, they did. Yeah. And so I started in, in radio. Mm. That's how I met my husband. Oh, he was married to somebody else, and I was married to somebody else, but we <laughs> fell in love. And he, uh, he wrote and directed the Buster Brown show with Smile and Ned oh, McConnell. Oh, I must say. I remember those. Yes. Well, I, he I think wrote, Tommy Cook used to play on those. Yes, those, Tommy it? Cook. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was so nice to see Tommy here. You sure. know, We're both older people now. <laughs> Your husband's name was? Hobart Donovan. Oh, oh that name is... Very, Very familiar. familiar. Yeah. Yes, he he wrote uh, Escape to Burma. He wrote for Loretta Young and for theater and, mm -hmm. and a lot of radio series. Good. And we were married ten years later. Oh, for heaven's <laughs> sake! Did you ever do anything uh, for Armed Forces Radio during the war or yes, after? Uh, Tom Lewis? Well, I appeared. Uh, it was the theater on Vine Street mm -hmm. when they had the the live shows. And Jerry Lewis and Danny Kaye would yeah. be doing their shows. And the writers always had me as one of the foils, and it was fun to yeah. do. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's strange about the, <clears throat> the Lady Maple Leaf stories. We had the earthquake in 1994, and I live in Woodland Hills, and it was very close to the Northridge uh, quake area. Mm -hmm. Everything fell off and broke. But I was going into my garage, and there were scripts on the floor, and I thought they were my husband's scripts. Mm. They were my lady make-believe scripts. You still have them? Yes. Oh. Oh, my and goodness. I re-read I re them. I loved them. I recorded six, and I sent them to Ted Turner, and he bought them for $10,000. For heaven's sake. Wow. Aren't and, you glad you kept those? <laughs> yeah, when well, yeah. I didn't get anything for it. You know. yeah. But uh, when when uh, Turner was bought by Warner's and AOL bought Warner's, 
They didn't want them, so I called Atlanta and I said, could I have my scripts back? And they said, you'll have to wait for two more years until the option is up. I did, mm -hmm. and now I own them again. Oh, good. Yeah. Did so. you write them in longhand or type them? How did you originally do them? I had a type. I wrote them in longhand and then I typed them. Typed them up. Yeah. Oh, boy. See, that's, that's testimonial for keeping things that you thought you'd never use again. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And you know a funny thing, Ray Bradbury's a friend of mine, and uh, I went to a Chuck Jones' birthday party, and I was sitting next to Ray, and I said, you know, I wrote, we were talking about writing, and I said, well, I wrote a lot of things too. And I said, I wrote <clears throat> a lot of war dramas for the Office of Civilian Defense. He said, for Joe Michike? And I said, yeah. He mm. said, well, so did I. Boy, I and I never met him then. It huh. was later on that I met Ray. I think Chuck Jones was born in my hometown of Spokane, Washington, as I recall. Oh, he was? Yeah, I, I didn't know I that. I didn't know that. I looked it up on IBM. He, he was a good friend of mine. I'll bet he Hired was. me all the time. So you were doing radio shows uh, on national programs. Yeah. The first one I ever did was a Cavalcade. Cavalcade of America? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you played uh, various dramatic roles? Yeah. Those it was amazing. Uh, one of them was Escape to Burma. Was that what it was? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, Burma Surgeon. My wow. husband wrote Escape to Burma. Okay. Uh, it was uh, Burma Surgeon mm. for Cavalcade. It was sponsored <laughs> by uh, some wine. Roma, something Bla Roma, Roma. Blanca. Something Cresta Blanca. Blanca. Cresta Blanca Cresta wine. Cresta Blanca wine. Yeah. You mm. remembered. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, that led into uh, eventually <laughs> going into cartoon work? Where did that work? Not quite. I did a show with Steve Allen for two and a half years. It was called Smile Time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve wrote all the scripts. Excuse me. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Steve wrote the scripts. And we had a, a, a young man who did the singing. And I was Junie the girlfriend. And uh, it was on, on KHJ, not sponsored, but it was national radio, at 7.15 every morning, every weekday morning. Oh, wow. And I would do crazy, crazy voices. And I guess Capitol Records heard about me doing all these funny, crazy <clears throat> voices, and they put me under contract. Not for him. With any specific project in mind, or just to have you available? Well, uh, for their children's stories. I see. And also, at that time, neither Disney or Warner's had a record company. Mm. And so I would do all of the characters that were in the cartoons. Mm. So then, I guess Disney heard all of the things that I did. And he hired me to do the cat in Cinderella. Oh. That was my first animation show that I did. The cat in Cinderella. And then I worked a lot for Disney. Mm -hmm. And then my agent called, it was 1955 or 56. He said, uh, how about working at Warner Brothers tomorrow? And I said, oh, that's great. He said, you'll meet Chuck Jones. And I said, Chuck who? I, you know, I really didn't know about cartoons no. very much in those days. And that's when I first met Chuck. And I started as bro uh, Broomstick Bunny, Witch Hazel. Oh, yes. Because I had done Trick or Treat <laughs> with, with uh, Disney, and her name was Witch Hazel. And when I read the script, I thought, how does Chuck have the audacity? But I didn't. I didn't say anything because I had never met Chuck before and I didn't want to accuse him of no, doing no. it. But you know what? It made Disney quite angry and I never worked for Disney again. Oh dear. Not until television lately. Mm. Isn't that amazing? I, I, I'd heard stories that Disney uh, company could be a little bit difficult if they didn't like something you were doing. It, and yet it wasn't my fault. No, it didn't sound like it. But Chuck, because Witch Hazel couldn't be copyrighted, copyrighted mm -hmm. because it's a 
alcohol rub or something. Yeah, I remember something that yeah. came in a bottle, and if you had a yeah. mosquito bite or something, yeah, right. <laughs> you'd, you'd rub that on yeah. witch hazel. Sure. Gosh. Well, you got into uh, into animation at that point then with Cinderella, and Chuck Jones grabbed you up for Warner Brothers, and what happened after that? Well, then uh, Frizz Freeling, who worked at Warner Brothers, he knew that I could do all these things, so he hired me for Granny. Uh-huh. I didn't know it had been done before by B. Benadaret. Oh, really? Oh. But I didn't know that, so I thought I invented a new character. <laughs> and so I guess I don't sound anything like her. <clears throat> I've never seen anything. So I invented my Granny voice, a sweet little old lady, you know, who's protecting uh, Tweety. Mm-hmm. So then I started doing all kinds of things. Uh, uh, Bob McKimson did a, a takeoff called The Honey Mousers, and I did Alice, you know, I did an impersonation of Alice, you know, and, mm-hmm. and The Honeymooners. Honeymooners. Huh. And uh, then I just went on from there, and uh, Walter Lance heard about me, and Walter called me to do Not Hidden Splinter. And then I started working for all of the animation studios. How do you go about developing a character voice? They would, at first, they never showed me a picture. Never? But they, well, later on they uh-huh. did. Um, but um, I would say, well, is she old? Is she young? Is she fat? Is she mean? You know, I, I would ask what kind of mm-hmm. identification personally they would have. Uh-huh. And so I invented those voices. Boy. And then um, one day my agent called. No, it wasn't my agent. It was Jay Ward's secretary. And she said, is this June Foray? And I said, yes. She said, well, Jay Ward wants to meet you for a lunch. She has uh, an idea for a series. So I thought, well, what the heck, you know, a free lunch in Hollywood, is, yeah. it ain't bad. Not bad. So <laughs> You didn't know Jay Ward at that time? No, right? I didn't. Yeah. I had never seen, what did he do, Super Chicken or uh, something like that, I mm-hmm. can't remember. But I had never seen it in the 40s. Yeah. And uh, so I met him and Bill Scott, who was the head writer, and they, they were drinking martinis. And they said, have a martini. And I said, I, I can't drink at lunch. I never do. I'll have one before dinner and that's it. Mm-hmm. And they said, oh, come on. So I said, okay. <laughs> so then they started talking to me about a cereal with a moose and a squirrel. <laughs> and I thought it was a cockeyed idea. You yeah. know, because they'd be the only animals talking to the other people who accepted them. Sure. But after the second martini, I thought it was a hell of an idea. It sounded better to you. Yes, it did. (laughs) So about a week later, we did the demo. And I didn't hear from Jay for a whole year. And finally, his secretary called and said, remember you had lunch with Jay Ward and Bill Scott? And I said, yeah. He said, they're ready to go. My heavens. And that was a But not a word between the time you did it and the time. No. Isn't that amazing? You'd given up hope by that time, I suppose. Well, you never think about it. And I was no. busy anyway, you know, Doing other things. working all the time. So. Sure. <laughs> Once you develop all these voices, I mean, that's a wonderful talent in itself. But then how do you keep them straight? I mean, my gosh, how do you remember how Granny sounded or, or someone else? I just remember. Do you? I guess when you do things like that, like, um, you know, I, I did Natasha, too, mm-hmm. so... Uh, Rocky would say, Hokey Smoke, haven't I met you some... No, darling, you do. In the same breath. Gosh. But um, it's easy when you know how to do it. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> and most people don't know how to do it. <laughs> you, were, you were a very, very talented lady, obviously. You worked with Stan Freeberg on, yes. on all of his records. I remember in the mid-50s when... I was spinning records on radio station in Great Falls, Montana. Oh, in uh, Montana? Yeah. Really? We'd get the Capitol Records in, and there would be a Stan Freeberg. Present the United States of America. Yep. That's when we were under contract to Capitol. Uh, that was in the early 50s. Uh-huh. You weren't involved with John and Marcia, were you? Remember no, the, he did that. He did that by himself. By himself, yeah. 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 Stan's quite a guy, quite a character. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very talented man. Oh, man, is he? Yeah. Not the easiest man to work with uh, sometimes. He had a show for us on Armed Forces Radio, so uh, I, I, I know him pretty well. You, the first time I ever saw you, I was the program director at the Armed Forces Network in Panama. I came up to the Hollywood headquarters, and Jack in Brown, Panama, Panama uh, oh, Canal my Zone. Yeah. yeah. So I came up to, to Hollywood, and, and uh, Jack Brown at Armed Forces Radio and TV. I said, remember him. Said, "Would you like to go over and watch them uh, do voices for a cartoon? It's just around the corner here." So I said, "Oh, that'd be great." So we walked over, and you and Dawes Butler were performing. I've forgotten what, what the cartoon was. But I remember being totally taken aback because I always imagined that the voices were done after the cartoon oh, had, no. been, had been... Uh, they do that in Japan, do but they? not here, yeah. But there you were performing in front of a microphone without anything in front of you to indicate what the action was or, or, or right. what was happening. It was amazing. Well, also... <clears throat> I did a lot of um, ADR work. Sometimes in a motion picture, they didn't like the woman who was speaking, and so I would, I would ADR replace that woman's voice. ADR standing for what? Additional dialogue Recorded. replacement. Okay, replacement. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did a lot of those. I worked on Jaws. I did the boys who were. The little boys who were out in the ocean. Mm. I oh, I worked on a lot of shows. Now, see, that's something that I don't think many people would 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 know about your talent. No, because we we picture you as doing the cartoon voices. But sometimes people recognize my voice now, and they say, "Oh, I heard you on the bells are ringing." I I did a lot of a lot of things, huh. and um, they used to call me one take for a because. In that time, they didn't have a computer, and so you they they would have it on uh, on a real real tape that that would just go by, uh -huh. and then you count to three and you do it. You do you know, it. The line would go by, hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so timing was very important at that time. Yes. Point. Yeah. Yeah, I did Cannonball Run with uh, Burt Reynolds. Burt Reynolds, yeah, yeah. Burt Reynolds. Uh, doing doing the ADR would be a matter of syncing, in many cases, your voice to what's happening on the screen. Yes, yeah. And you could do that in one in one take. Yeah, boy. Because I was so used to doing it, and you'd see if somebody was just taking a breath, you mm. knew that they would speak right away. Ah. And uh, so when you saw the line go by. You knew just when to say it. So I never auditioned. People would just call me because they, they knew I could do it. Somebody said that you were the female Mel Blanc. And then another person said, no, Mel Blanc was the male June Foray. Chuck Jones said that. Did he say that? Chuck was the one. <laughs> it embarrasses me because Mel was so talented. You Did know? you ever work with Mel? Oh, I did 39 short films with him at Warner Brothers. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I had never met Mel before. But uh, the first time when I did Broomstick Bunny hmm. in 1955 or 56, that's when I first met Mel. For heaven's sake. And then I did 39 shows. Now, back in the days of... of radio shows that were broadcast nationwide, you had to do two, uh, two feeds, one for the East Coast and one for the West Coast, right? Yes, at 5 o'clock to the East Coast, and then we'd come back and, and at 8 o'clock and do it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some of the, you know, there was a Brittingham's bar and restaurant right near CBS there, uh -huh. and they'd come back at 8 o'clock, and some of them were just completely inundated with alcohol. <laughs> I was going to, that was my next question. How many <laughs> martinis were consumed during that three-hour period? Oh, my period? God, I never did, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I understand. That was quite a, quite a, a talent to come back and be, appear to be sober when one wasn't really. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, um, Rocky and Bullwinkle went on for a number of years. 
Yes. And you did not only Bullwinkle, but uh, a lot of other voices. I didn't there. do Bullwinkle. I did Rocky. Rock, I'm sorry, you did Rocky. Rocky and yeah. Natasha. Yeah. And then I was Dudley Do Right's girlfriend, Ned F Nell Fenwick. Uh huh. And all the Brooklyn princesses, you know, in the Fractured Fairy Tales. Oh yeah, Fractured Flickers, you did. And Fractured Flickers, yeah. These were, these were all Jay Ward productions. They were all Jay Ward, yeah. Did you get involved with Hanna Barbera at all? Later, Later, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Yeah. Jokey Smurf, you know, that was Hanna-Barbera. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, I did a lot of those. Yeah. Eight years, I think, something like that. My, you know, that, I was thinking the other day, uh, people who are in the motion picture industry and make movies, and, and those films are around for hopefully forever, and eventually will be seen by various people, but even more evergreen are cartoons. I mean, your cartoons are going to be seen by people for hundreds of years, I would guess. How does you that know, make you feel? It's very interesting. They used to redub them in different countries. Mm -hmm. Because once, when I, one of the times I was in Italy, they were playing the Smurfs. And so I went to uh, the television city there. Uh -huh. And I said, gee, I want to listen to it. It wasn't I. It was dubbed in Italian. Uh -huh. But now that most of the people in various countries hear it in English, they keep it in the original English. Sure. I get fan letters from Singapore, from India, from Japan, from Poland, Germany, the Slovak Republic. My goodness. Gee, that's terrific. It really is, and yeah. they're, they're fans of mine, and, and the letters are charming. They're in broken English, uh -huh. but they're, they're so flattering, it's wonderful. I bet it is. Yeah. Now, in, in the early days, uh, what, 40s and early 50s, there was no such thing as residuals. No. Payments, and that, but now there are, so I assume that you were getting some sort of reimbursement for your talents throughout the world, no? After, in the middle 60s, but I don't... I don't get one penny from Rocky and Bullwinkle, and they've sold hundreds and thousands of DVDs, mm. hundreds and thousands. And of course, Jay is gored, but his daughter has taken over, and she and her mother are multimillionaires now. And, oh, I'll bet. But we don't get a penny. But mm. but everybody loves Rocky. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah they. I guess <laughs> when I got my star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Steve Allen was, because I had known Steve for so long, yeah. uh, Steve was my, uh, my guest speaker. And while he was talking and making jokes to the audience, he said, he looked at me and he said, you know, you really do look like a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Steve, wasn't he a wonderful guy? <laughs> oh, and so talented. And... A very sensitive man and a very yeah. introverted man. You would never know. I understand that he was, yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah. Dear person. He sure was. And he, he had very high standards for his work. And uh, he, uh, he uh, I think he was a founding member of what's now called the Parents Television Council. Uh, he, yes, he was very conscious of society and the way it's it's become sort of malignant as far as language is concerned and mm -hmm. things, and he was very concerned. I keep in touch with Jane all the time. Do you really? Yeah. Good. She's still in this area, living in this area? Yeah, she lives in Encino, uh -huh. near me. Uh -huh. Well, that's good. Yeah. Now, you are one of the last, I guess, of the big cartoon voices that we remember. Dawes Butler is gone. And Paul, uh, Paul Freese Freese is gone. Don Messick Paul is Winchell gone. Paul Winchell is gone. Don Messick is gone. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You're the survivor. I'm lucky, you and I'm still working. Still, that's even better. <laughs> that's even it's crazy. better. Gosh. Crazy. Is your husband still living? No, no. I'm sorry, I lost him no. quite some time ago. That's a shame. Yeah, it is. But keeping keeping busy will. <clears throat> well, will I was on the board of governors for 26 years at the Motion Picture Academy. For heaven's sake. And chairman of the short films and animation branch. Oh wow. Yeah. So, so you, you do keep involved, and now you're with oh, the Pacific, yeah. Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. Is fortunate to have you on our board. Yes, and I was on the board of the uh, Record Academy representing children's stories. Uh-huh. Good. 
As a matter of fact, one of the stories that I wrote as Lady Maple Leaf, um, I, I got a, a, a nomination hmm. from Naris for that. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Who would you, uh, if you had to pick a name out of your illustrious hat, who would you say would be your most memorable person that you've ever worked with? The one that... Voice over, you mean? Yeah, voice over. I think Bill Scott and Paul Fries. Both of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Call support Paul Winchell. You know, they're all so good. Yeah. That you hate to say one is better than the other. Well, they're not really better than the other, I suppose. They're probably they're more versatile. More versatile. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Paul was a great talent. So. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. Well, if we have brought you up to date, have we? Is there anything else that we need to include in this audio history of June foray? Well, mm. the fact that I'm still working is is nice. That is extremely uh, nice. Uh, I did a lot of Tom and Jerry's, and uh, when uh, when Hanna Barbera were out at MGM, they created them. Then when they opened their own studio. I think 57 or 58, MGM didn't do them anymore. And then when Warner Brothers closed in 1964, they immediately grabbed Chuck Jones oh. to work over there. And he started the Tom and Jerry's again. He did? Huh. Yeah, he did. And I did a lot of those. But he also brought some of the animators with him. He brought Mike Maltese, who was his head writer, mm -hmm. and Maurice Noble and Benny Washam, a lot of the people uh, that he worked with him at mm -hmm. Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I narrated a DVD. They're, going to, they're doing a DVD, and uh, then they're going to put uh, clips of some of the Tom and Jerry's, and uh, they said, well, who else should narrate it but June Foray, who did so many of the voices mm. with Chuck? Sure, So sure. that's what I did, and, mm. and then I did A Crazy Old Lady last week on Flapjack, and so I keep busy, which I, is kind of nice. Very nice. I would like you to close this out, if you wouldn't mind, June, because this, is, this recording may be listened to in future years by people who will go to the PPB right. uh, archives and right. dig it out. Give me a little bit of as many voices as you care to do, just so they'll understand what we're talking about. Well, Hokey Smoke, that's Rocky. And Natasha Dalik. And uh, Jokey Smurfs was like that. And... Uh, Grammy Gummy was a very sweet gal like that, but Ma Beagle was that kind of a voice, but she was a, a crook, you know. And, um, oh gee, what else? I've done so many. Yeah, it's hard to, hard to sort them out. Cinderella, you did the... Uh, like, I did the cat, the cat. Lucifer. <laughs> he didn't have any dialogue, but I was working for Walt Disney. Uh, and boy, that was quite a thrill. You know, all the things I did for Walt until 1955, I never met him. Hmm. And I felt very bad about That's that. A, well, yes, that would be wonderful to have met him. Yeah, yeah. but then he, he didn't like me anymore when I did Witch Hazel for Chuck, so <laughs> I didn't work until he died. Yeah, know? boy. It's weird. Have you seen the animated uh, Pixar... It's not a cartoon, but a full-length feature called Wally. e by any Yes, chance. it's an animated feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah computer animation. And if you recall, about the first half hour, there's no dialogue at all. It's all sounds. Yeah, yeah. And it's just amazing that the, how the sounds of that, of that character came across in the movie. Well, I, I'm not on the board anymore of the Motion Picture Academy, but I'm still... Uh, judging films in the short films and animation branch. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I was instrumental in getting a, a feature. Really? Uh, animation uh, Oscar, because they didn't want to do it. They thought, oh, well, you know, nobody will... Who, who goes to the animation features? And Walt Disney will get them all, you know. But, yeah. but then Jeffrey Katzenberg called me when he won for Shrek the first time. Oh, did he? To thank me, yeah. Well, it's a fantastic career that you've had. 
And, and still having still it. Still having it. And yeah. it's wonderful to know. We've been talking with uh, the great queen of voice performers I read on the internet, June Foray, who has done so many things and has entertained children from time immemorial, it seems like. And not only children, but adults as well, because everyone remembers Rocky and Bullwinkle and other uh, wonderful character cartoons. Uh, we've been talking with her. She's in the on the board of the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. And uh, this recording was made on February the 9th of 2009 in Woodland Hills, California. My name is Jerry Fry. I'm the audio historian of PPB. And we thank you very much for listening to us. I thank you, Jerry. Thank you, June.